Welcome to Swimming with Alligators. I'm Ernest Sweat, and each episode, Alexa Benz and I give you a VC podcast from the LP perspective. You ready? Let's dive in. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Swimming with Alligators. Today is a twofer featuring Avanish Sahai, board member of HubSpot, representing both himself as a high net worth individual, speaking to how he's putting his own capital to work, as well as as a venture partner at the Brazilian corporate fund of funds, Synapse. It's not every day you get to hear how somebody is investing their own capital. We really appreciate how transparent he is. Thank you. Let's dive in. Welcome to another fresh episode of Swimming with Allocators. Today, our guest is Avanish Sahai, board member of HubSpot and Birdie AI. Avanish is an expert in product, marketing, and ecosystems. He's held leadership positions at Oracle, Salesforce, McKinsey, Google Cloud, as well as a handful of startups. We're eager to talk to him today in his capacity as a venture partner for Synapse, the Brazilian corporate fund of funds, as well as as a high net worth individual making personal LP investments. Thank you for sharing your perspective today. Great, Alexa. Great to be here. and Thanks for having me. You know, when thinking about as someone as an individual um, looking to invest in funds, but like what kind of led you to that? You know, you had some experience or, you know, you were around the Silicon Valley technology space. How do you did you then take that step to, oh, I want to invest in funds? Yeah, look, I think I, it's a first and foremost, you have to network. Right, your um, the access to becoming an LP is non-trivial. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a lot of demand in some cases, especially the larger firms. Uh, they have the network of LPs tend to be obviously institutional investors, the traditional endowments, many times uh, founders and executives who have been in their portfolio before. So that's the natural starting point, right? If you have any one of those qualifications, um, it's a bit easier to, to have those conversations. Secondly, uh, again, to the networking point, getting to know people, right? Understanding who are they, what drives them, what, what are their investment theses and strategies. And then third, I think as, uh, frankly, as a network evolves, then network effects kick in, so to speak which is you work with one, then there, you know, you may join, uh, have an opportunity to join a, a uh, investment as a direct investor. And that one thing leads to another, you start, you know, building your, your own ecosystem of interesting uh, firms and funds, uh, and also sometimes the companies themselves. So it's a progression. It's a, and it's a journey to, to your point. So that kind of speaks to, you know, one of my questions was, as someone who's an individual, how do you really do diligence? Um, I have friends, you know, in different points of their kind of like career who want to become LPs and they ask me, you know, what should they be doing as far as diligence? So it sounds like for your perspective, the diligence was actually taking time to get to know these different firms, gaining a perspective and I guess a thesis of how you could help and then what would interest you the most. But was there anything kind of other tips and tricks of like how you got to this point and um, learnings that you had to help develop kind of the process to, oh, I'm going to put a check in the, to this firm versus this one? If you have the opportunity, it's not easy. But if you can talk to some of the portfolio companies of that fund, right? Talk to the CEO that received an investment, either currently or previously. Talk to some of the other executives. Uh, or maybe talk to some other uh, co-investors, right? They will give you the, you know, again, it's a small world. People know each other. Uh, they talk. So they, I think, will give you the most accurate perspective, right? It's not the, uh, the fun memo. It's not the investment deck. It's really talking to people. And, and again, the benefit of having been here for so long that is a relatively easy process. I know it's not as easy for everybody, um, but if there's a chance to do that, I would urge you know prospective uh, investors in this category to do to take that approach. Get to know people. Because when you think about founder to VC, it's like the, it, the 
it's not like Shark Tank at all, where <laughs> your your hand in hat asking, please, sir, may I have may I please have an investment? In fact, the founders that you want to be backing and the GPs you want to be backing are people who are sometimes difficult to get in touch with. And and um, yeah, it's the who is selling who is um, much, much less clear than I think on sh- a show like Shark Tank. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. How how do you think about allocation to private equity in the context of your personal wealth? The, the, you are in the room and you do know, know these people, um, but but where does it sort of fit when you when you look at your retirement plan and and is sort of maybe maybe what you want to pass along to your your kids? Yeah. Look, I, I don't think there's a definitive or mathematical answer to that, right? But I sit down, you know, with my with my spouse, with our set of advisors, say, okay, what's what's a range of allocations, right, that we should be considering for different types of vehicles? And could be direct investments in venture firms, could be uh, through fund of funds, could be in, you know, access to some more uh, typical PE funds. And say, okay, based on the total assets that we have, liquid, non-liquid, short-term, long-term, et cetera, what's our comfort zone in allocation? So those are the kind of things you have to think, really sit down and think about. Uh, and then maybe start with a tiny percentage. And then as you feel more comfortable, as the process becomes a little bit more familiar, uh, you can increase it to you know, maybe high single digits or, or higher, but it's. I think it's a again, it's a journey and a process. Yeah, and and you had mentioned the timeline too. Well, so that's that's the one thing that sometimes people forget, uh-huh. uh, which is these are a typical life of a fund, of a venture fund, is eight to ten years. I hate to use a very simple analogy, but it. It's not like a mutual fund that you can redeem with a you know a days or two days notice, right? These are this uh, these investments are committed. They are somewhat uh, obviously stuck in that fund and in the portfolio they've invested in. Um, and then over time, you know, maybe four, or five, six years down the road, you'll start seeing some uh, returns based on exits, based on hopefully some IPOs and whatnot, but it is a, it's a long game. And I think the time horizon sometimes is something people, uh, I don't know if they forget or if they don't, don't take the same amount of time thinking about, but you're, you know, whatever allocation you make to it, you're not, you're not going to have that in a, in a liquid form. Now we're going to take a quick break to speak with our sponsor. On the show today, we have industry expert and sponsor, one of my all time favorite founders, John Ling, co-founder and CEO of Canopy. Canopy streamlines the administrative process. Think legal, wires, taxes, et cetera, for private equity co-investments and SPVs. Thank you, John, for partnering on the show. What is the origin story behind Canopy? So I think I really started Canopy from, you know, an idea that I sort of observed when I used to work in venture. Um, Started out my career in venture capital, worked at a relatively early stage fund, that was around, I think, you know, $200 million ballpark. But I think what I really realized was when I was there, we had a lot of, you know, large follow-on opportunities and some of our most successful investments where like the pro rata was some magnitude beyond like the size of checks that, you know, our fund is capable of writing. So, you know, my boss would like go around, talk to some of his, you know, closest LP relationships And then, you know, I guess we don't really set up a lot of like co-investment vehicles, I think largely because, you know, it's not the general partner's like main job, right? Their goal Mm -hmm. is really to make sure that their existing investments um, are successful. And it really takes up a lot of time in terms of like managing the data room, the relationships, getting all the documents signed, so on and so forth. So I think when we were first thinking about like, hey, how do we streamline this process? A lot of it is really sort of like, taking a step back and viewing the sort of investment problem or the co-investment problem really as more of a process problem. 
Um, mm -hmm. And that's why we sort of built like an end-to-end -end platform, right? Where we help you manage your LP relationships, help you circulate investment opportunities, get documents signed, get the bank account set up, um, get the wires in, wires out, et cetera. And yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, where we started. No, it's, it's a, that pro rata is so valuable to be able to actually take advantage of it. Um, without yeah, I mean, I think really, headache. yeah, I really think it's a way for people to, you know, compound their returns on their best investments mm -hmm. very easily. I think like that, I think the ease factor is probably like the biggest portion of it. I think a lot of people don't do it today because they're like, okay, I have to like, send emails with all of these LPs who are going to ask for all the information. I'm going to forget who I talked to. Maybe you like you overcommitted allocations to specific LPs and then they're mad at you now because you're like, <laughs> oh, actually, I have to cut you back. Even I told you you could have like $10 million or whatever it is. Right. And I think, you know, having like a built in dashboard to track all of these things is very valuable, especially across like, you know, multiple GP or multiple stakeholders. Right. Where, you know, a lot of times it's like, hey, you know, maybe I hold really tight, you know, LP relationships with these three people. My partner holds, you know, really tight LP relationships with these other three people. And then we don't really talk, right, throughout yes. the day. It's not like we're on a Google sheet or something like that. I think most people tend to operate individually in silos and they only come together every now and then. So I think like really having a platform helps a lot in terms of like communicating with everyone, right, and making yeah. sure everyone's on track. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... How does this core syndicate product work? Yeah, I mean, I think the way we really think about it is at least in terms of like differentiation from, you know, platforms like AngelList, at least historically, um, we tend to think of ourselves as like, you know, software to help you run your business more so mm -hmm. than actually like, hey, you can use our fund infrastructure, right, as a master quote series vehicle that people tend to set up. Um, but yeah, so I think our thought process is, you know, we go through onboarding, we show you how our software works. And then at that point, it's sort of like up to you. We make it really easy for you to, you know, import your LP database from whichever source you have. Um, we try to make like the process really streamlined in terms of like circulating opportunities as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, probably end to end, you can set up an opportunity maybe in like, I don't know, 20 minutes, depending on how much yeah. detail you want to add into it. We have some, you know, AI capabilities as well, where we can say like, hey, give us a pitch deck, give us like the latest board deck or like, you know, whatever email summary you have. And then like, we will put together like a summary or like a memo mm -hmm. for you. Right. And I think like things like that, where we really try to make the process a lot easier and remove sort of like the onus on like the GP to prep really like all of the materials just makes it a lot easier for them to say like, hey, you know, like finger in the wind, like, is this something that you're interested in, right? Like they're raising, I don't know, $500 million, led by whatever. Here's like the latest revenue numbers. Like if you're interested, we can hop on a call, right? But like, mm -hmm. you don't want to sort of like waste too much time, I think, figuring out if someone is actually interested or not. And like, as I think the GP, you really want to like really focus on very high conversion rate conversations. And I think our goal is to help you do that very easily. And yeah. I think after that, like once you're ready to commit, you know, you just click a button to sign, click a button to wire. Um, obviously, like I think that's for smaller checks. So we also work with, you know, individual investors, um, mm -hmm. like syndicates, right, in a more traditional annual list type of model um, where they're more comfortable saying, OK, I'll leave my bank account mm -hmm. and I'll click a button to send the money to you. Right. Whereas obviously larger institutions would be like, OK, let's do a callback for wire verification. Right. And we're around for that, too. So. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's helpful to understand that you've got these giant limited partners coming in on some of these co-investments all the way down to angel angels writing, uh, smaller checks into syndicates. hundred percent. John, you clearly are out ahead on the future of venture capital for those interested in using canopy software to set up funds, manage capital and report performance. You can please visit heycanopy.com backslash allocators. And then Ernest and I get credit for sending you. Thanks so much. And now back to our LP interview. I uh, I have, there's an amazing quote from Jason Kalkanakis that he and his wife call them money bombs because you kind of like forgot that a decade ago you like 
invested in this emerging manager and then like the one company hits and distributes and you're like ah 10 years later surprise money bomb <laughs> but it, it speaks to what you were talking about like you need to you know talk to your financial advisors and see what essentially can you put away that can go to zero or one day you can have a money bomb I'm hopefully hopefully a lot more of the money bombs than the zeros but yes yeah, yeah, exactly. yes yes you know i would assume from your experience in developing relationships you really leaned on your expertise and knowledge within the tech industry to have more comfort. Um, but as we know, in America, there are so many wealthy people who are outside of the technology industry, and yet they're hearing more and more about technology, either startups and venture capital being the best asset class uh, of equity, best performing asset, asset, uh, equity asset class, or they're hearing about technology entering their, their industry that they're in uh, and wanting to get involved. How would you advise them on that comfort level of where they should start? Is it finding the right advisors? Is it, what would you say to them? Yeah, look, uh, uh, I think you, you asked it exactly the right way, Ernest. Uh, I've been involved in the software business for 30 plus years. Yeah. So this one, arguably, um, I would think of myself as a bit of an expert. And if it's a software company in whatever form, from a software as a service to cloud computing to now even AI, fintech, et cetera, I can do a pretty good diligence myself and either uh, obviously work with a venture capital firm or maybe even make a direct investment as an angel. And again, I have high confidence uh, that I'll, I'll have a pretty good sense for what the opportunity is what the challenges are, where I can be helpful, et cetera, right? So that's, uh, that is a, uh, frankly, a privilege of having been in the sector. If someone is not coming from a particular tech sector, and we know, again, there's biotech, there is uh, life sciences, there is now, frankly, there's been a lot of crypto for, for a few years, right? All kinds of things. I think you have to find, again, trusted advisors. And there is ways to do it either indirectly through fund of funds and they do the allocation, they do the diligence, they do the analysis, um, or through other forms of advisors. But, uh, don't, I would strongly urge folks to not go down this path, uh, because it's, it's hard. So I think finding the right folks to help you in that process is super. Cool. Speaking of fund of funds. Our audience may not be familiar with SNAPS. Um, mm -hmm. Could you give us a quick background on the organization that you work with? Yeah, so uh, Synapse VC is a Brazil-based uh, firm, and we call it a platform for investing in diversified assets. What does that mean? We are closely affiliated with one of the largest multifamily offices in Brazil. Uh, that manages you know multiple billions of dollars on behalf of a number of families. And what we've done with Synapse over the last uh, six, seven years is build a model where we're exposing these multifamily offices who've you know raised uh, they've raised funds from you know, their personal wealth and their trusts and so on. But to the point we were discussing earlier, I'm not that familiar with either the venture model, the technology business, they've read a lot about Silicon Valley, many of them have visited, but they don't have that proximity or the network that we we're discussing earlier, right? So what we do with Synapse is provide those family offices and that, uh, that multifamily office firm access to the venture model, right? So we are a fund of funds in that sense, where we have expertise, we have relationships, those of us involved in it have done this before. So we are, we're exactly in that category of helping people make that, that choice, allocating part of their, their assets to this asset class, educating them about what it means, what are the trends, what are the challenges. Um, you know, so we, we try to be that bridge uh, in that communication. Um, and then occasionally uh, with Synapse, because we have relations with some of the 
the best firms in the Valley. We also make uh, co-investments. So we can allocate part of those funds to do, uh, we invest in venture firms as an LP. And another part, we make direct investments in companies that we think are of high potential. So that's the, the basic Synapse, uh, Synapse VC background. And you carved out a role for yourself as venture partner. What, what, what are you, what does that do? What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. So we, um, uh, two, uh, two of us who are retired, I, I didn't say this earlier, but I, my background is I'm born in India and raised in Brazil. So mm-hmm. as I retired, um, I knew the founders and the general partners of Synapse. And we started chatting about, you know, what's next? And we all had similar backgrounds. We have technology backgrounds. We have entrepreneurship backgrounds. We've raised venture uh, venture funds in different situations. So we said, you know, let's uh, let's talk a bit about what what could those of us, the founders, the founding partners are in Brazil, but a couple of us, Emilio Omeoka and I, have lived in, have lived and worked in Silicon Valley and in, in some pretty well-known, work with some pretty well-known companies uh, for quite some time. And we both thought, hey, this would be a good way to both, uh, frankly, diversify a bit of our time. Uh, we are LPs ourselves in Synapse. Um, and what we're doing as a venture partner is doing a, a couple of things. One part of our time is spent with the uh, investor, sorry, with the uh, VC funds where we are investors. Mm-hmm. So we are continuing, remember we talk about relationships, right? So we continue building on those relationships, uh, going to their LP meetings, uh, meeting individually with the general partners, understanding investment theses, changes in in kind of market trends, um, understanding what what stages of funds they're raising, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So it's a kind of a more in depth on the ground uh, engagement. The other thing that we are doing as venture partners is also. Because we have backgrounds in, again, the tech sector, software as a service, enterprise software, et cetera, we're also a resource to some of the portfolio companies, for those VCs. Uh, and in a handful of times, we've also done, uh, as I mentioned earlier, co-investments with those firms. So we can be you know, an advisor, but we can help them maybe navigate a particular set of issues, et cetera. So it's, it's a few roles like that where we're using our backgrounds to be a, uh, a skilled experience resource to the both VCs and to their portfolios. The boots on the how, ground. How, yeah. <laughs> yep. How do you think about, um, I would assume with international, um, you know, family offices and their interest in venture, right? U.S. has, has a very um, mature market that still has a lot of upside. Um, What's the kind of thought process on portfolio construction, especially Mm -hmm. from your venture partner role of being that advisor and letting them know where the winds are going Um, when it comes to, you know, established firms uh, versus kind of emerging managers when there, there could be at any point in the market, there's a point when people are, um, when firms are, have reached a point of, of rele- relevancy and yeah. that they plateau yeah. and others come up uh, to, to find the best companies. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great insight, Ernest. And, and that is a bit of our investment philosophy, by the way. So I can disclose which firms we've invested in due to confidentiality, but um, there's a handful of major firms that are well-known, very well-known globally that we're uh, investors in. And then we've also picked uh, a small number of emerging managers where we believe in their, again, their backgrounds, their theses, um, the early portfolio that they've built, et cetera. So that is an ongoing process. And just by nature, um, those of us involved with the firm and the multifamily office that we work closely with, we're all very analytical. So we look at tons and tons of data. We look at, you know, investment reports from 
the major banks, from consulting firms, from uh, the research firms, etc. We talk to a lot, and I do mean a lot of folks in academia. So that kind of builds our knowledge base. From there, uh, again, uh, I think it's really important to reiterate this point. It is about relationships. Yeah. So if we find a trend and we you know, find a, a few the firms or funds that we are interested in, we try to reach out to them, maybe through direct contact, maybe through part of our network. Start getting to them, right? And sometimes it may take years, right? And I do mean years of those conversations before we actually make an investment, right? And again, it's a two-way street. Uh, we are trying to bring some to the table. The the firms and funds are looking for folks who can add something to their to their mix. So it is a you know a set of ongoing engagements and conversations. It's not an overnight, neither an overnight decision, nor an overnight success, right? So these things take take time, um, but we we do try to keep a uh, a global perspective, right? So what's happening in India? What's happening in Israel? The cybersecurity space. What are some trends of things maybe happening in markets where uh, we don't want to get into because we don't have, you know, maybe confidence in the market opportunity or some of the investment thesis. So all those things are part of our regular process. Are there any exciting opportunities that you are focused on right now? So um, it, it's a bit trite as saying this in 2023, uh, but we certainly think that AI is a is obviously a trend that's here to stay. Um, someone said this, and I kind of so I'll quote it, but I can't attribute it because I don't remember who said it. Um, and the point is, it's probably overhyped in the near term, but underhyped in the long term. So we believe that AI-based applications, not just the infrastructure, but also the applications and how it gets incorporated into other offerings and so on, whether it's in supply chain, whether it's in consumer apps, whether it's in stuff we do day to day, it's here to, to really make a massive difference. So a lot of our discussions, research, education, I did a session with uh, the LPs of Synapse earlier this year to give them, a, you know, to the point of the boots on the ground, give them a view from here, what it means, what some of the challenges are, what some of the risks are, et cetera. So that certainly is one we're, you know, actively looking and involved in and so on. Uh, another one that we're uh, approaching, uh, have not done huge investments of is, is cybersecurity. We think that is a category where, uh, again, the more digital we go, the more we have to be aware of all forms of bad actors, right? Whether they're internal, whether they're nation states, whether they're bad characters, et cetera. So I think that one still has a lot of future potential. Um, and then again, because of our backgrounds, our tendency is to focus a bit more on the software and enterprise software sector particularly. So uh, things like consumer software um, and the like, we we probably stay a little bit away from because back to the point made earlier, we cannot bring a lot of value to the table. I mean, we're not experts in it. We don't have particular networks in it. So we're not going to be a very valuable partner to either a founder or to a venture firm on that front. Makes a lot of sense. I, I totally agree with you on a lot of those fronts of the near term. Uh, I think the uh, AI's, uh, the application, um, the products that come out of it, especially verticalized AI, I think are going to be critical uh, given the labor issues in, in this country and over the world um, and diminishing returns that we're getting from legacy technology. What... Um, do you, do you also uh, see any opportunities internationally as as well? Um, are there any markets that your your firm is particularly excited about outside of the U.S.? 
Yeah. So, um, I, I guess, like I mentioned earlier, my background is a bit unique in that I was born in India, raised in Brazil. So we've been doing some investigations into India and India has grown very, very dramatically in the last 10, 15 years, yeah. both from a startup ecosystem perspective, from global companies and global opportunities perspective, and frankly, from a pretty, pretty well uh, oiled and active venture community as well. Mm. So uh, arguably, I'm a bit of the bridge into that in terms of, you know, getting to know people, investigating what what some of the trends are, how is it moving from a labor cost arbitrage perspective, which is where it started 20 some years ago, to really some pretty dramatic innovation that's coming out of India in many, many different fronts. So that I think there's some exciting stuff that could happen there. Um, as I mentioned briefly, I think Israel is a really interesting one from a, uh, you know, obviously our thoughts are with, with Israeli folks in terms of all the challenges they're going through. But the pace of innovation, the pace of global companies yes. coming out of Israel on relatively quick scale is mind-blowing. I, I, I just am always very, uh, I admire it a lot. Uh, so we've had some conversations there. Haven't done too much in um, China, for example. We have, you know, the usual concerns about uh, investments in China. Uh, but then again, Southeast Asia, there's, there's probably things that we'll keep keep an eye out for and see how that, that evolves as well. So you mentioned that, you know, the excitement of AI and cyber, and I'm going to assume that you're still bullish on the venture capital asset class. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to know outside of those two areas, what macro events what other things are you seeing that make you bullish on venture? Yeah. So I think broadly, Ernest, um, like I said, I've been in the Valley for 30 plus years. So I've seen the boom, the bus, the boom, the bus <laughs> multiple times uh, with different types of technology. And, and, and it's been, I know, it's been a privilege, right? It's been, a, it's been amazing to have courtside seats and occasionally even be on the court. Uh, in areas that are just uh, defining kind of how we how we live, how we behave, how we operate, etc. So, with that as context, I, yes, I am still very bullish on the venture uh, venture industry uh, because long term, I think innovation is still going to drive productivity. It's going to drive better better lives. It's going to drive, frankly, I think the uh, uh, the betterment of people's lives, right? So from that point of view, I have high confidence that what, what the venture industry provides is a bridge between great research in academic environments and so on. And how do you bring it to life? How do you make it better for people? So I'm frankly, uh, one of the themes I'm studying right now that I'm not an expert in is, for example, climate tech. I, I think that's probably along with AI, uh, without much exaggeration, the two things that are going to shape the future of humanity mm -hmm. and the planet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in climate tech, there's a lot of work, for example, going on in some of our premier universities. Uh, and bringing that to life, bringing that to commercialization, bringing that to scale, understanding how that needs to align with public policy initiatives domestically, nationally, no, regionally, globally. Those are big, big ideas and big opportunities. So I'm uh, eagerly engaged uh, and trying to learn more and more about that as one category. Um, second one, frankly, there's a lot going on. And this is an industry that I don't have expertise in. So I kind of watch it from very much from the, the nosebleed seats. Um, is the biotech and the life sciences space. Uh, the amount of innovation happening mm -hmm. on uh, disease management, on personal health, on you know, device-based improvements, uh, 
I was recently at, at an LP meeting for one of our uh, invested firms for Synapse. And two CEOs presented some technology they're working on, which blends AI and software and devices mm. and the biotech industry, right? These things are cross-functional by nature, um, but the problems they're solving, um, if, you know, if they go down the path which we think they will, it's mind-blowing. Right? So that's another category where I think there's just a lot going on and it has direct impact on the population at large. This has been such a pleasure. Avanish, do you have any parting words for this audience? There's uh, allocators as well as yeah. VCs. Look, uh, first of all, thank you for, for the fun conversation. It's always, uh, it's always great to you know, talk about sharing some of our experiences and lessons. Um, I, ha I think the lesson I've learned is uh, have confidence. Um, there is often this mantra out there, but, you know, the tech sector is going through a downturn, it's going through crisis and so on. Um, I still believe that we are in, you know, yet another cycle. We'll come out of it just great. And, uh, you know, again, don't go alone, right? So I think working with the right kind of advisors, talking to a lot of people, talk to people who've been through the journey, positive and negative, um, and then make your make your decision based on you know data and uh, having the right people to kind of guide you along the way. I can see why they like keeping you around on your boards. <laughs> <laughs> this would be some <laughs> helpful wisdom to have around the table. Comes with being around long enough and losing all my hair along the way. But in this phase of my life or career, it's all about giving back. And part of giving back is being a uh, being a resource, being someone who can, you know, uh, respond to questions. Uh, I am uh, an avid LinkedIn user. The best thing to do is reach out via LinkedIn. Um, I don't use the other platform, whatever it's called now, uh, X, but, uh, but LinkedIn is my, is my go-to platform for any kind of. Great. Thanks so much for being on Swimming with the Allocators. Really appreciate it. More than happy to be here. And thank you for doing this. I think it's important work that you guys are doing. See you later, Allocator. After Portfolio Tile, investing with a smile.